Hi everybody, it's Joni. I'm here from home, settling into my new office, away from the office. And uh, I think that all of the students right now that we work with are doing the same. And I wanted to let you know that uh, we are here with you and we wanted to make sure that you're enjoying your time and hearing from us while you're transitioning into your new routines. Part of the way that we've decided as a team to contribute to you as students and going through this process with your family is to think of unique talents or specialties that we have personally to give back to you and to share with you through this journey because we're all in it together. And one of the ideas that we came up with was for me to tell some traditional tales. And I thought that was so cool because um, our people, uh, people of Alaska are super resilient. There have been so many tragedies, natural disasters and illnesses that we've had to work through to get together um, as communities for survival. And that's been happening for thousands and thousands of years, not just particularly in Alaska, but all over the world. Um, be an honor to share a story with you from my region. If you don't know this already, I'm from Northwest Alaska. I am from Nome, which is on the very north, just underneath the Arctic Circle on the Seward Peninsula. And the story that I want to share in particular is the earliest recording from my region, the people of the Quaric. And the story uh, that I'm going to share is an excerpt from the um, People of the Quaric by William O'Quillock that was recorded in the early 1900s by the first settlers that were there um, working with the indigenous people. And this story is part of a tale that was passed down orally um, as stories were. There wasn't a written um, documentation for a language. What happened was um, that people, uh, usually missionaries, um, worked in conjunction with the families and were able to get Western style um, education to communities, including religion. But um, this uh, settler that came and was working with um, Mary Zigloo in particular realized that he had the ability to uh, do some written documentation of these early tales and. Um, the stories are phenomenal. They're from the early 1800s and previous. And I've also decided to share some photos from the region, in particular from the Norm region, because that's what obviously I'm most familiar with, but it's also very indicative of the place that they were during the times of these stories. And I hope you enjoy my little slideshow and take care of each other and, um, I hope that the takeaway from these stories is that we are resilient as Alaskan Native peoples and there have been challenges for thousands of years that we've had to overcome not only as Alaskan Native people but as a human race and we're in this together and we're here with you. So please reach out uh, via email or get in touch with the Fab Lab and we'll be able to help in any way. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye. People of the Quaric by William O'Quillock. Copyright 1973. The stories began long, long ago. They've been told by our ancestors from century to century, passing them on from generation to generation until I, Willem, a. Aquilic came into this time. I have heard of the three great disasters of ancient times and saw the fourth disaster of later times. Each one killed most of the people, leaving only a few to survive on the land. Those who survived each time made the population grow up again in northwest Alaska. Each time those few left told to tell their story of what happened in other centuries to the young ones while they were growing up. If someone writes these stories down, it should bring understanding and thoughtfulness to anybody who reads them. Writing down the stories began like this. When I was a boy, I used to go into the Kajki with the others. Sometimes, instead of dancing, they used to tell stories like this one. We used to hear stories. 
People liked to listen to them, but it seemed nobody was interested in writing them down, and I used to wonder about that. When I was big enough to go to school, eight or nine, there was one time that the teacher showed us a picture of George Washington. He told us that this was the first president. Then he asked us if anybody knew somebody like him, and I raised my hand. Yes, my grandfather knows those stories. He said, will you please get your grandpa now? I told him my grandpa did not speak much English. Then he asked me, do you know somebody who could interpret these stories from your grandpa's language for us? And I told him my uncle can do it, but he cannot walk. So the teacher had some of the bigger boys get him, and they carried my uncle John to the schoolhouse. The places that the stories tell about, like the caves, the places on the land, the graves, are those are things that I have seen. The only place I did not go to was where they got the sharp rocks to make ulus and knives. They were pretty high up and it was dangerous to climb up there. My grandpa did not want to take me there because I might get hurt. It was steep and he showed me where it was. My grandpa used to take me up to the places that he told me about. Other places I know about because I saw them later when I was herding reindeer or hunting. It would not be right to put things into stories. I did not know about myself, but if people wanted to, they could see the places for themselves. The young people and the children coming along could see how their ancestors used to live by the land, and they should hear the stories of their forefathers, just as I have written these things down. Part 1. The People of Cunic's Time A day came when the ancient Eskimo people never had expected. The sun came close to the full moon. Soon the sun went behind the moon. It happened around noontime. The sun eclipsed behind the moon and it was getting dark, but people could see it because it was not very dark. There was a kind of reddened color everywhere and it got cold. It began to frost on the ground. The animals began to roam around. The birds began to fly everywhere. It seemed that they forgot about each other and were not afraid. The people had no clothes to wear and they began to look for shelter. Some found caves. The animals were also looking for shelter. The birds were flying in every direction. The people could not hear much from each other because the birds and the animals were very loud. The sun and the moon stayed together for three days and three nights. Each day, less and less noise could be heard. On the third day, there were only a few noises. On the fourth day at noon, the sun came out from behind the moon, but it was still cold. There were only a few people who survived to see what happened when the sun came out to shine on the world once more. Every plant, all the grass and the fruits and berries were frozen. Even the birds and animals had died. Only a few large animals still walked around. There were only four families left after the first disaster. The time passed and the lives of the people changed as the climate and the land became different. In some things they had, their old ways, they seemed had never been forgotten. Then the second disaster came. It was a terrible flood and all of the land was covered with water. Only three families survived. The people of Koyaramit traveled everywhere. They lived in places called English names today. They lived at Cape Darby, Cape Nome, Sledge Island, King Island, Little Diomede, Cape Woolley, Wales, Cape Espenberg, Kotzebue, all the way past Point Hope. After the third disaster, there were only a few people. The ancestors said that only seven Kuaramut people were left. There were pu- two people left at Point Hope, Tigagmut, who were not Kuaramut. There may have been others living up near Wainwright and Point Barrow, but nobody knew beyond that. They did not go further south than St. Michael, so the stories did not happen from down there. Those few people living after the third disaster stayed mostly in Imrik Basin. There was plenty for everyone, and they were working to build their families strong again. The new generation sometimes went to other places to live. 
The Kuwera country was full of good hunting, so many men stayed there, and others came and found wives and husbands. Sometimes they stayed. This is how the population of this part of Alaska grew.